Welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off with part two of dental alveolar surgery. So we're now talking about impacted canines. Impacted canines are the second most common tooth to be impacted. Um, and the most important part is trying to figure out if they're on the labial or the buccal or the facial aspect as opposed to the palatal aspect. Because if you're going to expose and bond it, well, you got to know which side to approach it from. Well, there's different ways of doing that. The, roughly, the incidence of impacted canines is 2%, so fairly common. Like I said, second most common. It is interesting. There's different theories as to what causes impacted canines. And the theories correlate to the positioning. So if it's a labial impacted canine or a, a buccal or a facial, meaning it's towards the front, in that case, it's typically because of an arch length discrepancy, meaning there's just not enough space. But when it's labial, it tends to be vertical, straight up and down, and it, it, it's, it's on the facial surface, so it grew in the right position, and it's facing the right orientation, but it just could not come into the arch because there wasn't enough space. And that's a, as opposed to a palatal impacted canine, which has a totally different uh, theory as to what causes it, and those tend to be oblique or horizontal. And the theory there is that something was disturbed in the guidance. So we know that, or we believe that uh, canines follow as they erupt. They follow the signaling left behind by the lateral incisors. And what often you'll find when it comes to palatally impacted canines is that the lateral incisors are either missing congenitally or they're peg laterals. And that would explain for why the guidance went wrong and that's why these teeth are left off in the palate. Um, different ways of localizing which tooth you have. In the olden days with the plain film, and you would do the slob technique or Clark or same lingual opposite buckle where you take two different pictures and move it and you want to see if it moves same, then it's lingual. If it's opposite, then it's buccal. That's fallen out of favor now with technology. I mean, nowadays we have other ways of localizing it, namely a CBCT, which I would still say is probably nowadays a standard. But um, you could also take it on a pan, and there's been different studies that have showed if the tooth is vertical, it tends to be labial. And by tens, the study basically said that if it was 65 degrees or straighter, the odds of it being labial were 26 times greater. So you can almost bank on it. But again, <clears throat> nowadays, like I was saying, you probably would be better off getting a CBCT, not only just to tell if it's on the buccal or the palatal, but you'll get a better idea of exactly where on the palate it is. And that's certainly important when you're cutting into it to avoid cutting into maybe the lateral <laughs> um, when you do these exposed and bonding, you'll see if you're not 100 percent sure which tooth you're dealing with until you have enough of it exposed, you could and, and you could accidentally cut into a lateral incisor or one of the other adult healthy teeth that you don't want to be cutting into. So I highly recommend a CBCT, and I think nowadays on the boards that's a perfectly fine answer to get a CBCT. Um, so when you do have an impacted canine, what's the treatment? Well. Ideally, if you intercept it prior to the age of 11, prior to the age where a canine would erupt, well, you still can treat it without ortho. And there's different, uh, the successes are ba based on an old study that this comes from Erickson, but there's been a lot of other studies that have come up with similar numbers. He, it's Erickson that came up with five sectors, and he said based on based on the position relative to the lateral incisor. So this would be the primary canine. This would be the impacted canine. And here's the lateral incisor. So sector one and two, sector one is before it crosses the lateral incisor. Sector two is it crosses, but it's up to 50%. Sector three, four, and five is all meaning beyond 50%. And then even though they came up with five sectors, I find it interesting because ultimately they ended up grouping it into two sectors. And they found that anything in sector one or two, meaning anything that's less than 50% of the, if it didn't cross, less than 50% of the lateral incisor, then it has a fairly high success of erupting into the proper position, even without any ortho. Right here, we're talking about extracting the primary canine prior to eruption without any ortho, and you'll still get 91% success. Versus if it's in sectors three, four, and five, then the odds go down 64%. But still, interceptive seems to be a fairly uh, successful try, and if it doesn't work, then you can always consider ortho down the road. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so now when an oral surgeon would, be would encounter these teeth, we have three options for how to expose and bond it. 
So let's talk about expose and bond. Expose and bond is basically, as the name implies, you have to expose by removing the soft tissue and the bone overlying the impacted tooth. Specifically, you only want to expose the crown. You do not want to expose the CEJ or the root. Um, and then you bond a bracket so that it can be pulled into the proper position. Uh, for this procedure, after you flap it, then you have just three decisions of how to close it. One option is you leave the flap open, one option is you leave the flap closed, and the third option is you apically reposition the flap. So let's talk about apically reposition flap first. This you want to consider for labial impactions when you're interested in trying to maintain the keratinized gingiva and it's not too high in the alveolus. So a perfect example would be in this diagram that's illustrated here, it's labial, it's not super high, and you have good keratinized tissue. So what you'll do is you'll flap it, and you'll suture the flap in an apically repositioned position. Kind of like if you were doing a phrenectomy, or if you're doing a vestibuloplasty, often we, we do this where we'll reposition the flap. And you can see in this picture, um, the keratinized tissue is up here. And you may ask yourself, is this going to cause a perio defect? The answer is no, because the keratinized tissue that we're securing up to the, the crown, the CEJ, it's going to come with the tooth. It's going to adhere to the tooth, and then as the tooth is dragged down, the tissue is going to come with it, and there's going to be no peri peri uh, periodontal defect down the road. So this, an apically positioned flap is a great option if the tooth is labial and it's not too high in the alveolus. Um, if it's too high in the alveolus, then you should consider the closed technique. And the closed technique means you expose and bond it just like a normal. And then you close the flap. And the chain will come out through the flap and will come to your wire. And the chain will be coming through the soft tissue. And we'll pull on the chain and when the tooth is ready, the tooth, tooth will just uh, erupt through the tissue and then it will create it will just come into the right place and then you won't have a peri de defect at all so close technique like it seems you flap it and then close the flap leaving the chain hanging through uh, in this picture actually i like what they did um nardi caspic once gave a lecture on this and i thought this was a nice way of doing it instead of having the chain come on the buccal surface he actually punched a hole through this the 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 alveolar crest and he had the chain come underneath the bone like it's demonstrated in this picture so I would if you're going to do it like that that's a little uh, trick how to make it really neat and then ortho will begin traction one week later uh, and last but not least you have the open technique the open technique should only be considered for a palatally impacted canine you cannot do this on the buccal surface you will cause a periodontal defect now this works beautifully for the palate. So the way it works is you expose it by removing the soft and hard tissue overlying the crown. You place the bracket, plus or minus the bracket. I say that plus or minus because you don't necessarily have to because when the two, in this open technique, you're gonna then pack it with cotton or something to interrupt, disrupt the healing so it doesn't close over. And then it should, if everything's successful, it should remain open. And that's why you don't necessarily have to put the bracket at the time of the initial surgery because the patient could follow up with the orthodontist and he could put the bracket on. Uh, the, ha the advantage of doing the open technique is if the bracket ever were to fall off, it'd be easier to re-secure. Re and the orthodontist is able to put the bracket on and he may be able to put it in a different position or more preferable position than maybe an oral surgeon might. Um, so this is for the open technique, and this does not cause a pair of defect because all of the tissue on the palate is keratinized, so as this is dragged into the proper place, the tissue will come with it. Um, <clears throat> so those are the three techniques for expose and bond, a couple of points. When we expose, you want to expose the crown enough that you can get a bracket on, so you don't need to be overly aggressive and show all of the crown. Usually there's a follicle that when you remove the follicle that does get you adequate space to put the bracket on, but if you need to take a little bit more, but be very careful not to go too zealous, <clears throat> too aggressively, so that you're not exposing the CEJ, because if you do that can cause external resorption. Uh, what happens if the tooth fails to erupt? If you get, if you, at that point, so this happens a fair bit of time that you'll expose a bond, put a bracket on, and then the tooth, instead of it erupting into the proper position, all the other teeth, which the wire was attached to, they start to intrude. So at that point, then it's acting like an anchor or it's an ankylosed tooth. So once you suspect that the lateral, the canine is ankylosed, then you have a couple of options. One is you go back in and luxate the tooth. Now, luxating the tooth is not something that we typically do at the time of exposure and bond, but if you're 
but in a case of ankylosis and you have to go back, then you luxate the tooth. Or you could do chorocotomies, which would facilitate or expedite the ortho. And I, I like doing that. And last but not least, if you, you're to get ready to give up on the tooth, then you could always extract it. Um, other issues is the, the bracket could debond. That does happen a fair bit of time. Um, and we do not put wires. Historically, at some point in time, people were putting wires around the tooth. And of course, that would go around the CJ and cause resorption. So that's not what we use nowadays. Um, moving on to the next topic, which is nerve injury. So we got the inferior alveolar and the lingual nerve. Now, in terms of spontaneous recovery, the inferior alveolar nerve has a greater chance of spontaneous recovery. And that's because there's the canal. And the canal acts as a natural conduit to guide regeneration. Nerve recovery progresses very slowly, about one millimeter a day. Uh, a couple of definitions. Allodynia means pain from a non-painful stim stimulus. Anesthesia means just not feeling anything. Hyperalgesia means that you're feeling too, so something that is normally painful, but this is an exaggerated painful response. Hyperpathia means it lingers for too long. So something that that may hurt, but now it's just lingering for far longer than it should. Hypoalgesia means something that's painful and maybe you're feeling it just to a lesser degree. And hypoesthesia means uh, you're, you're not feeling sensitivity. You're, you have a decreased sensitivity. So anesthesia is complete absence. Hypoesthesia is decreased. Hypoalgesia is decrease of pain. And hyperalgesia is increased for pain. Um, for classification systems, this is pretty important. So let's go over. There's a Seddon and a Sutherland classification system. Let's start with the Seddon because it's fairly simple. You got three different classifications. You got neuropraxia, axontomesis, and neurotomesis. So neuropraxia <coughs> is the first and the simplest. So neuropraxia, I like to think of it as a sprain. There was no axon continuity uh, disruption. The axon is completely intact. The only thing that happened was either due to severe manipulation or compression, the, the nerve was essentially sprained. And so there's no treatment required and we do expect spontaneous full recovery over the course of a, a few weeks or a few months. So again, neuro, neuropraxia is a like a sprain. It was due to compression or manipulation and it should recover completely without doing anything. Axontomesis is a partial transection. Anything, anytime you hear the word tomesis, think of karate chop. So axontomesis, and then lastly, you got neurotomesis. Axontomesis is partial, neurotomesis, the whole nerve, complete transection. All right, so going, going through axontomesis in a little more detail, this is the middle category. Axontomesis means you lost the axon continuity, and then it, we'll get to the Sutherland later where we subdivide this up, but the point is part of the axon is lost. So the endoneurium and the perineurium is intact, just the epineurium is disrupted. Or in some options, the perineurium is intact, but the endo and epi are both disrupted. Um, but to some degree, it's intact. So you have some amount of, of the nerve is still intact, and some of it is injured. And generally, for this axontomesis, we consider surgery if there's no improvement after a few months. But possible spontaneous recovery is possible. So we generally, for this middle category, because the nerve is not completely transected, we'll watch and wait and we'll go to nerve testing and later in this talk but as long as we're doing nerve testing and watching then we don't need a rush to surgery and last but not least the third category in the seven classification is neurotomesis which means karate chop and that means the complete nerve transection um, now in that place you're going to require surgery and there's no chance for spontaneous recovery uh, now so those were the three set in at neuropraxia, axontomesis, neurotomesis. Sutherland came up with five classifications. So the Sutherland one, that correlates to neuropraxia. And Sutherland five correlates to neurotomesis. The only difference is he subdivides this axontomesis middle category into three more. And it depends on what layers of the partial transaction transpired. So in the Sutherland two, you have two out of the three layers are intact. The endoneurium and perineurium is intact. The only thing that happened was the epineurium was disrupted. Whereas in Sutherland 3, you have the, just the perineurium is intact, but the endoneurium is disturbed. So just the perineurium is intact. And in 4, 
the epineurium is intact, but the perineurium isn't intact. So this would be like a crush injury. Um, and again, it's like we said before, with the southern, anytime you get to this middle category, you kind of watch spontaneous recovery is possible, but it just depends on improvement and your nerve testing. Um, that was the Seddon and Sutherland, which are very classical and highly important to know. Um, more modern uh, modified research, modified medical research council skill, MMRCS. This scale is fairly commonly used in modern or current literature. You'll see this quite a bit, so let's get to know it. And one thing that's really nice about this scale is it's very easy to do practically. It's three quick assessments and they can all be done with one instrument. So you're assessing pain, touch, pain would be you're pushing really hard, touch, you're pushing really soft, and then two point discrimination. So if you have a cotton plier, you could touch using all, you can assess all three with just that one college plier or cotton plier. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the scale. It starts with S0 and goes all the way to S4. S4 is perfectly normal. S3 means complete anesthesia. Let's go at one at a time. So if you have S1, that means the patient could feel deep pain. So they could feel pain and nothing else. That would be an S1. S2 means they could feel superficial pain. So they could feel touch. So again, S1, they can only feel deep pain, and S2, they can feel superficial pain. Once you get to S3 and 4, there's actually only very little difference between them. S3, they can feel superficial pain and touch, but their two-point discrimination is pretty bad. It's 15 millimeters. When it gets to S3+, plus, it's everything is the same, meaning you feel superficial pain and touch. You can feel two-point discrimination, but here, instead of it being 15 millimeters apart, your two-point discrimination is about 10 millimeters apart. And last but not least, S4, which is completely normal, is everything as before, meaning pain, touch, and your two-point discrimination is perfect, which means 5 millimeters. So again, the difference between S3, S3+, plus, and S4 is just the two-point discrimination. Here it's 15 millimeters, here it's 10 millimeters, and here it's 5 millimeters. Um, and we'll talk about two-point discrimination. For the, this is important to know for the boards, but you know, practically, just if I can di uh, tangent a quick second about two-point discrimination, I don't love it. Practically, it's very difficult to do. In patients, there's a wide range of normal, and it even depends on the area that you're testing. So the normal area, the within normal range for the chin, can be 10 millimeters whereas the lip is much more sensitive the lip tends to be four millimeters so if you're trying to differentiate between s3 s3 plus and s4 be careful that you're testing on the lip and not on s4 there's a couple of other reasons why i don't like two-point discrimination um, you have to make sure you're within the same field right if you go too far anytime you're anytime more than 20 millimeters you're essentially outside of that single dermatome and anytime you cross midline then you have to worry about contralateral uh, innervation so there are some clinical d difficulties with two-point discrimination but this is a very easy scale and i hope uh you know you guys are familiar with it it certainly appears all across modern literature um all right now let's talk a little bit about testing so we have a dilemma here we know on one hand our success will be best if we intervene soon right in the case of a, a, a an observed transaction obviously in that case you're not going to wait three months you, you're going to you're going to intervene immediately. And we know the success goes down in a linear manner the longer you wait. That said, there's plenty of papers out there that will say we had good success even 12 months later, even 18 months later. But that, and so usually the papers will tell you that time was critical for intervention and also age. So that's another linear correlation that as the patient gets older, their chances for recovery diminish as they age. Anyway, so on the one end, we know the sooner we intervene, the better. On the other hand, we know that um, recovery is possible, spontaneous recovery is possible if we wait. And there are some case reports that it could take six months or 12 months or 18 months. Uh, right? Sometimes patients will recover after a prolonged amount of time. In fact, there was, I should review this in the literature, there was an article that, um, that we'll talk about, it, it was in Jameis of this month, so this would be 2021 if anyone's watching this down the road, that talked about patients that had complete transaction, they had, this was for, uh, for pathology, they had no attempt to salvage it, and then 10 years later a lot of them did have recovery, and there's probably different theories as to how the brain remapped that, but we, we do know that recovery is possible, so how do you balance it? So the, I, the, the answer is you have, to, you have to watch and monitor and frequently 
do nerve testing. And what you're looking for is signs of improvement. If the patient is showing signs of improvement from one follow-up to the subsequent follow-up, then there's no reason to intervene. As soon as they show no signs of improvement, or if they have neuropathic pain, or if a witness transaction, in any of those cases, you should intervene. But as long as they're showing improvement, then there's no reason to just to continue to watch and wait. <clears throat> when it comes to nerve testing, um, we have level A, B, and C testing. And this is divided based on the different nerve fibers that exist. Um, let's just review this very briefly. So level A is spatiotemporal proprioception. And that's based on the, sens sens uh, the sensitivity of the alpha the alpha the a alpha fibers so the a alpha fibers are the really fast big fibers and they measure things like proprioception and we'll talk about what tests you can do but it's like localization or or motion and that's how you would test the a alpha that's level a level b consists of the a beta fibers and that's generally touch these are also myelinated and they're also fairly large but not as large as a alpha and last but not least is the level C, which is testing for pain. Level C fibers, uh, sorry, the C fibers and also the, the A delta fibers, they both test for pain. Now the C fibers are specific, they're very different from the rest because they're non-myelinated and they're much smaller. And because of this, they tend to be a much slower conduction. So, you know, if you can think back to when you touch something like a hot pot of soup, you don't necessarily feel the hot right away. Usually you'll put your hand on it, you want to know if this is hot or not, and then a second later it will hit you, ooh, that's hot. And what's interesting, so it's, it takes longer to kick in, because these are slower fibers, but they also last longer. So sometimes you'll pull your hand away from that hot pot, and your hand still hurts even a few seconds later, so it lingers. Uh, now, the reason we test in this order is because the, the C fibers are much more resistant to injury versus the a alpha fibers are very sensitive to injury so we start with the most likely to be injured which would be proprioception then we work it to touch and then we work it towards pain all right so let's go through it the way you would do it you would test out of 10 times and you want to see if the patient can get it eight or nine or ten times out of ten and that means they know what they're talking about anything less it's fairly like they're just guessing i know i did this on myself i was trying to get two point discrimination and I probably got like 5 out of 10 because I was just guessing. It was so subtle, I couldn't really tell the difference. And of course, you want to always compare it to the contralateral uninjured side. Um, all right, so let's go through the three levels now in a little more detail. So level A, like we said, was proprioception, and there's three different ways you can do it. You don't need to do all three. The point is any of these three would be testing the A-alpha fibers. So you could do brush stroke identification. So you take a swab, and you want to know if the patient could tell you what direction, up, down, left, right, and if they can guess right or they can tell you where they feel the direction is that's proprioception their proprioception is intact two-point discrimination would also qualify and localization so that means you point to something and then you ask the patient to point to where you pointed to and as long as they're within a few millimeters of where you're pointing to their proprioception is intact in any of these cases if their level a is intact you do not need to go any further because we know this is the most sensitive and if the a alpha are intact then the patient has normal sensation if not, then you would go on to light touch, which would be level B testing. And there's different ways of doing it. You could just do it yourself with light touch. You ask, you lightly indent with like a, a Q-tip and you ask for them to feel it. Um, if you want to be a little bit more objective about it, there are the Von Frey hairs that you should be familiar with. And this is basically like a calibrated system and each one of these are a different gauge and you wait till they deflect and each one will have a different strength and you can essentially assign a number value to make it more objective to assess what is the level B, what is the, the light touch sensation for this patient and you can give it a number value. Last but not least is level C. And again, if level B is intact, you do not need to proceed any further. If, level, if A and B are out, then you would move on to level C, which is pain or nociception. So here you'll take a, a, like a 27 gauge needle and you'll pinprick the patient. You can also do uh, temperature testing. You could take a heat of gutter percha and you could take cold from the ethyl chloride, the endo ice. Um, and you're testing hot, cold, and pain to see if at very least the level C is intact. Now, one thing that's important to mention, if you're trying to differentiate between central and peripheral, if a patient is having neuropathic pain, if they're having um, like 
allodynia. So they're having pain. So that might, so even if their sensation is intact, regardless of that, if they're having pain for no reason, well, then you may want to intervene. That would be a separate indication for nerve repair. And in that case, you have to differentiate, well, is their pain peripheral or central? So you give them lidocaine. If their pain is resolved from the lidocaine, then you know it's peripheral. And if their pain is undiminished by the lidocaine, well, then it's central in origin. All right, so like we said before, just to review, what are the indications for intervening? <clears throat> so the first one would be an observed nerve transection. So you transect the nerve, don't need to wait. You know it's transected. There's no ch that's neurotomesis, or that's a Sutherland five. So you know there's no chance of spontaneous recovery, and therefore you should intervene right there and then. Um, <clears throat> the second the second indication would be persistent anesthesia for over a month without no improvement. So you're watching them and you're doing serial exams and you're not seeing any signs of improvement. And last but not least will be dysesthesia or pain. Any patient that has pain, well then that would be a last indication to do intervention. What are the different interventions? So it's a stepwise, um, in a stepwise manner, you, you would start with maybe the first, so you, you have to first find the nerve, whether it, it's the inferior alveolar or the lingual. Um, if you know the site of injury, like if it was a tooth, taking out or if it was orthognathic. So you have to know the mechanism and you have to I try to identify the site. And that's particularly relevant because <clears throat> you go get a CT scan, you'll be looking for far bodies, you'll be looking for inflammation, infection. Um, and if you could identify the site, well then that makes the surgery, the exposure certainly a fair bit easier. Um, if you don't, if it was like an orthognathic surgery and it was not witnessed, well then it's much dif more difficult and it's hard to try to know where you, you you may have to resplit the mandible do a whole bsso it's very hard you won't be able just to do it like a buckle window at that point because you don't know where the nerve is anyway once you find the nerve then you're going to analyze the nerve under a microscope if you see any area of uh, if the nerve appears externally to be healthy as far as you can tell well then then you could stop right there and then that would be external neurolysis external neurolysis just means to decompress the nerve and just separate it from the surrounding tissue so sometimes there's just a lot of scar tissue all around the nerve but the nerve itself appears intact so you decompress the nerve and that's external neurolysis if the nerve appears unhealthy if the external surface of the nerve appears unhealthy and you see what looks like a neuroma or some kind of enlargement of the nerve in an irregular manner, well then you're going to want to excise the nerve. Um, oh, and I should also mention internal neurolysis is basically where you'll just take like a 15 blade <clears throat> or take scissors and disrupt the internal fascicles while keeping the external part of the nerve intact, the axon intact. So you just take you take your scissors and just spread to disrupt the fascicles so that it can essentially reheal. That's internal neurolysis. And then neuroma excision. So if you see what looks to be a clear neuroma, then you should excise it. The margins generally recommend to be three millimeters on each side, which then you can then submit for frozen biopsy. But you don't have to do that. You can just look under a really fine mat. Uh, magnifying glass and as long as the remaining nerve appears healthy and you can see the fascicles and you don't see any any evidence of scarification well then you know that you've excised enough after you've removed the nerve uh, at the neuroma and you're ready for repair of the nerve or if there was a transaction or for whatever reason whenever you're ready for the next step that would be the repair of the nerve which is also neurorafi direct neurorafi. So direct neurorafi means suturing the nerve back together. When you do it, you're going to take epineural sutures. So you're taking the teeniest, tiniest bites through the epineurium. You're going to use 7 to 9 O, and you're going to make sure it's non-resorbable. And the way to know, you don't even have to memorize this, but makes sense, because resorbable sutures, as they break down, they cause inflammation, which will obviously irritate the nerve. So we avoid that. So you'll take nylon or proline, and you'll use somewhere between 7 and 9 O. How many sutures? somewhere between two or three or four sutures but more is not necessarily better you just want to keep it stable and without like swinging you want to keep it in a position where it can heal without moving too much um so two may be sufficient and you just have to see how it holds with just two and then if you need a third you can put a third um <clears throat> if you do excise an aroma and there's a gap how much of a gap is tolerable? So a lingual nerve could tolerate a gap of a centimeter and the inferior alveolar nerve can only tolerate a gap of five millimeters. Anything more than that is known to cause tension. And if, of course, if your two ends of your nerve are under tension, well, then you don't, we're not going to expect a very good recovery of the nerve. So you want to make sure there's, it's tension free. If you have any more of a gap than that, then you need to consider a nerve graft or a conduit, um, which we're going to talk about nerve grafting now. <clears throat> 
so this is very important for the the boards although I should mention nowadays I think it's fairly common to use oxygen which is human cadaver allograft um, the advantage of oxygen or allograft means you avoid a second donor site um, so you won't have to get any and you won't have to trade once one area of anesthesia for another area of anesthesia um, and it also cuts down on operative time and other surgical complications but historically we would obtain nerve grafts from either the sural nerve or the greater auricular nerve um, it's not commonly done but I, I shouldn't say it's completely not done either some people still really like doing these surgeries um, and so it depends where you practice so let's just for the sake of this test let's go over I think what's important to know is the diameter so the inferior alveolar nerve is two millimeters whereas the lingual nerve is three millimeters um, the way I think about it is the inferior alveolar nerve is stuck in the canal and it's compressing and it's squeezing it and it's got to fit a really small little nerve in that canal versus the lingual nerve is you know unimpeded by any surrounding tissue it could be big and fatty and beefy and that's how I remember that the lingual nerve is three millimeters as opposed to the inferior alveolar nerve is only two millimeters now when it comes to our graft options, we have the sural nerve, which is 2.1. So the sural nerve in diameter is closest to the inferior alveolar nerve, whereas the greater auricular nerve is only 1.5 millimeters, so it's very thin. And because of this thinness of the greater auricular, sometimes you actually need to take two of them and line them in parallel, which is called the cable graft. So sometimes you'll have to do that if you take the greater auricular. Now I do think it's important to know where you harvest it from. So the sural nerve, you're going to get it it is below and posterior to the lateral malleolus so the lateral malleolus is this big bulge on the lateral side of your foot and if the sural nerve is behind it underneath it um, and lateral to the lateral malleolus um, and if you do take the sural nerve then you could expect to get anesthesia over your heel like i said you're trading one area for another but most patients shouldn't complain about anesthesia over here um, there that and then let the, that's opposed to the greater auricular and the anatomy for the greater auricular is it's exactly halfway in between the mastoid and the mandible so you draw a line from the mastoid process to the corner of the mandible the angle and somewhere halfway in between you should expect to see the greater auricular and I'm sure if you guys have done neck dissections you always know you're the most posterior aspect of your next dissection that's where you typically encounter your greater auricular nerve um, and the greater auricular nerve you'll get some anesthesia of your lateral neck and earlobe um, but again most patients tolerate that quite well um, last but not least besides for third molar extraction you could also consider coronectomy right when we talked about before the criteria the the panoramic radiograph signs where you're, you're you have a high likelihood for nerve injury in such cases you should consider coronectomy in coronectomy you're removing all the enamel and the roots three millimeters below the alveolar crest that's important to allow bone to grow over the remaining retained root so you want to be three millimeters below the crest now there is a 30 percent chance that the roots will migrate which is not a problem from the patient but the patient should be warned that they may need a repeat or a second surgery because if the roots migrate they need to be blocked out but if that does happen that does not increase the risk for nerve injury um, it cannot be done in the following cases a horizontal impaction might be one of them a because it's difficult to get three molars based on you know the positioning but also because often in a horizontal impaction the, the nerve is right underneath the crown and the whole point is to avoid injury of the nerve but when you do a cornectomy and you cut off the crown well then you're you're jeopardizing or you're putting the same the same nerve at risk just by cutting off the crown it cannot be done for infected roots now that doesn't mean if there's occlusal caries it can't be done just if the roots if there's a PAP if there's any any pathology on by the roots then it wouldn't be able to be done you wouldn't be able to do it for ortho obviously that kind of makes sense if you need to distalize the second molar well then leaving the root in place is not going to help you and anytime you have mobile roots then you can no longer leave them so if you intended to do a coronectomy but in the process of doing your split you mobilize the roots well then you have to continue and take out the teeth and that is it for this section, and I hope to see you guys next time.